Bill Comrie, United States Army, Vietnam. Bill served in the 21st Signal Group in Vietnam as an aviation specialist, and I was fortunate to interview him in Abingdon, Maryland, November 30th, 2006. It's been a number of years ago. Bill was in his late 50s during this interview, and it's a great story. It's a, it's a unique story of what he did in Vietnam, folks. And I want to thank James Yost. James, thank you for sponsoring Bill's story, making it possible for others to hear and to see and to learn about what Bill went through in Vietnam as a young man. Folks, if you'd like to sponsor one of these stories like James has, I encourage you to do so. There's information in the video description, or if you want to donate to my work, in the comment section or go to my website larrycapato.com it would be greatly appreciated take ownership in, in what i'm doing here as i have many stories to share all the interviews are done now i'm sharing these stories from 10 15 20 years ago and it's just been a blessing and so many comments about these videos so many nice things have been said about this documentary series i never plan to release these stories so this is raw unedited so if you have a problem with that uh, you might want to watch something else but i've interviewed these veterans to be part of documentaries that i've produced over the years but now i'm sharing their stories and many of you have jo enjoyed them and i want to continue doing it so share the stories subscribe to the channel get involved sponsor one of these stories and let's keep this thing going folks god bless you Now. I'm uh, 58 years old. Okay, 58 years old, and what year did you go to Vietnam? I went there in August of 68. And I'm not real good at math, so how old were you then? Uh, 20 years old. Okay, and you were enlisted? You enlisted? Well, I was uh, in a strange situation. I was actually drafted out of, uh, when I was in college, and uh, when I got there, uh, an officer came around asking for people to volunteer for what they called a critical MOS program. So I actually resigned my draft situation and uh, became an enlisted man uh, to, to get to critical MOS school. And the reason I did that is because uh, after I took my battery of test and basic training there at Fort Benning, I found out that I was going to infantry school and um, I wanted to have, a, uh, have a, at least some type of training, some type of skill. So I uh, s uh, signed up to a critical MOS school to become an uh, aviation repair parts uh, uh, tech uh, spe uh, specialist. Sure. And what was really unique about the entire program was that uh, uh, after the critical MOS school, I became an E4 out of one school, and they sent me on to another school, and I became an E5 right out of the second school. And uh, it was quite, quite unique. I, I became a Spec 5, E5, with within seven months of my military service. So that was quite, uh, quite uh, rewarding. So what was your thoughts about Vietnam at the time and you going, knowing you, when did you realize you were gonna go there? Well, um, I um, corresponded with a lot of my friends uh, that were, when ahead of me, uh, people I knew from high school. I was in college for a year and a half, so a lot of, a lot of the men, a lot of the young men that I knew from, from school went ahead of me and uh, they were telling me the, the various uh, um, uh, situations that they were in and they basically were telling me to, to beware what, what's over here and uh, advised me to try and avoid it if I could. But um, my family has a strong military uh, background history, it goes all the way back to the Civil War. Uh, someone has been in, in each military engagement the country's been in since then. So, I wasn't going to duck my military uh, obligations. Um, I was in college um, uh, full time for my first year, and then because uh, this is long before student loans became available, I was working my way through college. And uh, my second year, I um, 
was working my way through college and uh, got to the point where I was going to halftime status and the draft board drafted me. So I went in and um, 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 with, the, with the idea that I was going to be drafted and I'd, I'd serve my time. Uh, in the meantime, before that, I was actually talking to an Air Force recruiter. I wanted to become a pilot. And of course, they said the best way route for that is to ha have your four-year degree completed before you came into the Air Force. So that was my ultimate goal. So I had to pl have plans on going to the military anyhow. So I wasn't going to avoid it. And then when I got drafted, I accepted it and, and uh, actually got my draft notice the uh, day before Christmas in 1967, which wasn't uh, the best of timing, but uh, that's what uh, that's what came about. And then by January 4th of 1968, I was at Fort Benning, Georgia. and. Uh, Went through my basic training, had a holdover period for about four or five weeks for a security clearance. I wasn't quite sure what the, what was going on with that, uh, but after that was over, then I went to my AIT, um, went home on a weekend pass and married my high school sweetheart, and um, uh, brought her back down to Fort Lee, Virginia with me, and we lived there for a couple months until um, I uh, got my orders to go to Vietnam. And when I signed to get this uh, critical MLS school, the proviso was that I had to, I'd had to be a three-year an enlistee, uh, and also um, they needed those people in Vietnam uh, directly. So I knew I was going to Vietnam. I just wanted to go with a skill and have a chance to work in what uh, what you might call a, a rear echelon uh, base rather than to be uh, a um, grunt out in the jungles. More or less a self survival thing sure. before I even got there. <laughs> T tell me what you remember about first going in country, what you saw, what you smelled, what you felt, I mean, what, what you heard, what was it like mm -hmm. when you first got off the plane in Vietnam? Okay. While my journey to Vietnam was quite quite eventful, um, um, the crew that flew me over, I think it was either World Airlines or Seaboard World, one of those, the crew that flew us over, um, I don't know if many people remember this or not, but in 1968, there was a jet that strayed off, off line a little bit and was uh, captured by Russian uh, jets, and they had to make a forced landing in Russia. A lot of people don't remember that, but uh, they were held for maybe about two or three weeks, and then they were all released. That flight crew was my crew that flew us over. They had a three-day leave. They all gathered again, and then they flew us off. And they were kind of joking about this was their first flight since that incident. Um, I knew about it because I read it in the newspaper. And um, here when we took off from Anchorage, Alaska, after we left Fort Lewis, uh, the jet almost crashed at the end of the runway. It was really uh, a harrying thing, uh, a horrible thing. It was We were going down the runway and um, we were overloaded, I think. It was a stretch DC-8. and. Uh, I, I was sitting back near the, either in the last row or next to the last row, right by a window, and the jet was running down the runway, but it was skipping. It just wouldn't, uh, wouldn't get enough lift to take off. And uh, I was looking out the window, and I could see uh, the numbers counting down, five, four, three, two, one, and at the end of the runway was coming, we were still on the ground. And just at the last moment, we just, just got enough air and got up in the air and just cleared the fence at the end of the runway, and there was a big sigh of relief. Uh, we went down through uh, Japan, <clears throat> landed there for fuel, and went into Vietnam. We were laying at night time, and of course when the doors opened up, um, you didn't get to see anything, but you could smell the, the, the atmosphere, you could smell the, uh, the uh, odor of uh, Vietnam. It was uh, the, the combination of various things, uh, fuel from the jet aircraft, uh, uh, the, the cooking oils, uh, uh, just the the humid air, it was a, it was a smell that uh, you'll never forget. And I <clears throat> had direct orders go right to a, a particular unit. I wasn't going to a replacement center, which was kind of a strange uh, and uh, uh, unique situation because most uh, Vietnam veterans uh, went to the replacement center and then they were sent to where they were needed. Uh, my orders sent me right to the 43rd Signal Battalion up in Pleiku um, in the Central Highlands near um, near the Cambodian border. So uh, that's what I remember of my trip to Vietnam. Well, tell me about what you, I mean, okay, I'm not still sure exactly what you did in Vietnam, but tell me about, um, uh, just, did you get, you didn't get in combat then yourself? 
No, I was not a combat service. You supported combat. the uh, aviation unit? Is that what you right. did? Did right. you work with the Huey helicopters at all? Yes, right. Okay, can you just tell me a little bit about the Huey, what it was as a helicopter, and mm -hmm. then what it was used for in Vietnam? Sure, sure. My unit was uh, in the Signal Corps, and um, <clears throat> our, our unit was the 21st Signal um, Group. They were in charge of four of the various battalions, 43rd Signal, 41st Signal, 73rd Signal, and 459th Signal battalions in various cities in the Central Highlands area. And uh, when I arrived there, our aviation uh, unit had uh, airplanes and helicopters. We had um, a, a big uh, Otter, it was a single engine Otter. We also had s smaller single engine uh, uh, Beaver aircraft, uh, U-1s and U-6s. And they were used to haul uh, equipment uh, and troops to various places. But then they found that, that uh, our um, uh, area needed helicopters because we were setting up a lot of signal units on the mountaintops. And of course, you can't, couldn't get the airplanes in there. So uh, we traded our uh, airplanes in for uh, uh, more helicopters, and we ended up with about mm, 12 Hueys. Huey was a great uh, aircraft. It was able to go anywhere. Uh, Strategically, we could get to any of our sites uh, within uh, uh, within four hours flying time. It was fast, mobile, and we could take everything between troops, equipment, and everything we needed uh, to the various sites. It was a great aircraft. And tell me about the purpose. What was it used for? <clears throat> the Huey. Uh, for, in our unit, it was used basically for support, uh, to, uh, to take uh, simplest thing from a letter from home uh, to uh, signal equipment, um, radar sites, uh, troops, um, uh, food, fuel, anything like that. Uh, it was not used in a, in a combat situation. <clears throat> um, I mean, we didn't uh, go on strafing runs or anything such as that, uh, although we always had door gunners with, their, with us because we never knew what situation we would be called upon. <clears throat> Sometimes we'd be flying in various areas and if there was an emergency near us, we would be called upon to make a emergency landing to pick up uh, someone who might have been wounded or, or maybe another aircraft had difficulty, we'd have to pick up some crew. So therefore, we always had to be um, armed and ready to go for action because we never knew exactly what was going to happen when called upon. Sure. What about some of the action that the troops saw? I mean, the, the fighting. I mean, who, who are we fighting in Vietnam? Well, uh, the enemy uh, was very elusive. We, of course, never knew where they would come from or when they would be there. It was a guerrilla war. Um, a lot of our mountain sites uh, were, were precariously placed on various mountains, nothing around them but uh, jungles. So those people uh, were... Uh, uh, I, was luck I was glad that I was just flying in, dropping things off and, and leaving because I, I, I just didn't uh, like the situation they were in because the, uh, the um, jungles and, uh, and surrounding area would give, um, give uh, ideal hiding spots for the VC and the NVA to sneak up to these various bases and, and do, their, do, their, um, do their thing. So I personally never really saw the enemy, um, although I knew they were around. Um, and um, we were trained to, to react more than to, to act because we were a support unit. Were there friends of yours in Vietnam that were wounded or killed? Yes. Uh, when I was in high school, of course, that's when I became aware of what was going on in Vietnam uh, through through debate classes that we had, and um, um, s through some friends that arrived to, went to Vietnam before I went there. Um, one of my best buddies in high school went to the junior ROTC program, and he was uh, Ronnie was uh, a uh, a very good friend of ours. He was going to be a Mr. You know, Mr. Green Beret when he went in, and uh, unfortunately, when he went to Vietnam, he was killed within five months after he got there. And uh, that was really a wake-up call for myself and a lot, a lot of my friends when when he passed away, because we just never thought that would ever happen to him. But uh, he unfortunately was near an area when, when one of the mortar rounds came in, and uh, and that uh, took him out. And uh, we uh, went to his. Uh, I was in college at that time. We went to his funeral, and it was just heartbreaking to see 
him there and see his family there and uh, the realize, realization of what was actually going on um, hit me at that point and uh, I knew it was a real thing. The letters I was getting from my friends that were in the Marines before me, they were up near the i Corps area, which was a very hot zone, and uh, they were um, give, sharing stories with me at that time to, uh, to cause uh, some fear and, and anxiety on my part. But, um, and have you ever been to the, to the wall, the Vietnam Wall? Yes, yes. I've been to the wall uh, several times. In fact, I was there when it was dedicated back in uh, well, 24 years ago, 1980, 82, 83, when it was dedicated. <clears throat> and I was there for a couple reasons. I wanted to pay respects for the, the men that, uh, and women that died before me. Um, I wanted to see their names on the wall. And uh, I was actually searching for my old buddies. Uh, but I couldn't find anybody. It was really strange, just being the day before the internet, back in the early 80s, um, it was more or less, uh, I wrote my name on a little sticky note and pasted it on this big bu uh, bulletin board that they had there. In fact, they had six or seven bulletin boards with everybody looking for other veterans and other friends, and uh, it was a mass of thousands and thousands of guys looking for old buddies, and it was a uh, uh, it was kind of strange because, you know, there were, what, three million troops in Vietnam um, in, uh, in, uh, were veterans, and I bet, I bet there was maybe 15 to 20,000 veterans that, that I saw that were there looking for people, and we had a very difficult time connecting. But uh, that was the most frustrating part about it, but the, the dedicating the memorial and watching uh, the people give their speeches and and paying respects for the deceased was a very, uh, very good time. I took my wife and uh, my two children with me. We stayed uh, stay for the weekend, and uh, we went to the Washington uh, uh, Cathedral and we listened for names. We were there when Ron, Ronnie's name was uh, uh, listed because my uh, wife uh, knew knew Ron and his family well, so uh, uh, we were there for for the reading of his name, and uh, it was just. Uh, Quite an event. My children, I guess they were, let's see, how old were they? They were about 12 or 13, mm -hmm. 11, 10, 11, and 12 and 13. They were two, I have a son and daughter. And um, uh, they, it was an educational process for them as well. They, they enjoyed the weekend. Yeah, I'm very moving uh, tribute. Um, so, as far as Vietnam, you were there for one tour? One tour, one year. Eight months in the 43rd Signal up at uh, what they called Tropo Hill, uh, just north of Pleiku, and then they transferred me down to Natrang so that I could actually work at the air, ba air base with the aviation unit. Uh, and Natrang is down along the coast, right along the South China Sea. So you guys never were attacked or had anything to do with the enemy, basically? You were far enough away? I was far enough away that I didn't really get to see uh, the enemy face to face, although we were on the receiving end of their. 122 rockets and their mortar rounds. What about um, reports? Were you hearing any reports of uh, casualties or body counts? Um, where you were at? What do you remember about anything like that? Well, one of our uh, uh, door gunners was uh, was uh, killed in action um, when one of our helicopters made a, a crash a crash landing in Dalat, which is in one of the mountaintop areas. The aircraft uh, had an engine failure. It was loaded heavy with the equipment and uh, passengers. They were hauling uh, some some workers to this mountain site uh, to work. Uh, Page Communications was were the people that actually put a lot of the communication towers together, and um, they had some passengers on board. And uh, the helicopter had an engine failure, <clears throat> and it went down on a mountainside and uh, uh, hit uh, hit the rocks. And, and uh, when it did, this door gunner of ours. Um, was thrown out and he, he broke his neck and of course he died. The unfortunate thing about him was uh, Sal, Sal was, uh, he actually worked as, as a desk, as a clerk in the headquarters building. And as our aviation was expanding and we got more helicopters, he volunteered to become a door gunner because he wanted to, he didn't want to go home to tell his family that he was uh, a clerk. So he volunteered to become a door gunner. Uh, uh, it was approved, and they sent him over to us, and we trained him to to shoot the M60 and uh, you know the skills he needed to be a door runner. And 
and unfortunately for him, he, he passed away within 30 days of arriving to the aviation unit. And uh, I communicate with his family right now by email, and uh, they were um, very upset with him passing because they thought he was going to a signal unit to be in a safe unit, and uh, he unfortunately passed away. And, and uh, <clears throat> I think they had some misgivings about what, what happened and how he actually passed away because the Army wasn't very forthcoming with the information to them as to what happened and where, why he was where he was and what was he doing, what was his thinking. So we set up a website uh, for our unit, the 21st Signal Group, and uh, pr pretty much that was uh, uh, an idea that was perceived by myself and one of my buddies in New Mexico, fellow veterans, he and I put it together. And uh, we were able to contact a lot of the people that actually worked with this guy, uh, Sal, uh, and uh, 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 we put them in touch with Sal's family and they, they got some information to share and now, and now they have a full picture of exactly what was going on, why he, why he volunteered for this uh, particular duty and, and they have a better understanding of what he did and, and they really appreciated us talking with them because uh, uh, you know, he just went to Vietnam, wrote letters home, but he didn't really, they didn't really get to know who knew him and how much everybody loved him and, uh, and uh, how much he, he, you know, he loved his country. And, and uh, it was just a very enlightening uh, an experience for both of us to get to know, uh, know their family. In fact, Salvador's mother is still living. She li they live in Menlo Park, California. What about coming home from Vietnam? Was there a homecoming? Did you hear, I mean, did you guys have a homecoming at all when you came back? No, that's the strange uh, thing about the, the Vietnam experience. Uh, just about everybody went on their own. Uh, the very first groups went over, uh, went over as a unit. But everybody seemed to be a replacement from that point on. So everybody went over solo and just about came home solo. And uh, although you, may have, you might have come home in a air aircraft, a jet with 200 uh, fellow troops. Um, you basically didn't know anybody, uh, although you were on the same, you know, everybody had the same goal to get home. And uh, once we got home, we, we did some pro out processing at Fort Lewis. Uh, that's where I went through. And uh, we got tickets to fly from SeaTac to Chicago and, and to Harrisburg, PA for myself. And pre it was pretty much a solo event. And uh, that was uh, that was the tough part about the, the whole deal. Uh, um, and that's what's so good about the internet right now is because now we can all get together and, uh, and resolve some of those issues and, and uh, restore that camaraderie that we had when we were over there. Why do you think a lot of Vietnam veterans uh, had problems coming back and transitioning back into civilian life? Well, do, you, do you understand why that happened to some of them? Or? Um, everybody's experience in Vietnam seems to be different. Uh, of course, everybody saw things in a different light. Um, I myself, I was in a support area, so I didn't really have the constant day-to-day -day fighting issues to deal with. Um, although we had some restless evenings, uh, that was a small, small thing to deal with compared to people like my cousin that was in up in Contum and Doc Tho where they had to constantly worry about someone taking a pop at them daily. But uh, um, everybody's experience was different and when they, they, they came home, um, uh, everybody, everybody dealt with their experience in a different manner. Some people, some people really had some stress to handle um, uh, and they, uh, some people, everybody handled their stress in, in a different manner. Some people um, became hostile uh, some people like myself, I kind of uh, went into a shell, just kept everything hidden. Um, so everybody dealt with it in a different manner. I spent the past 35 years working in financial institutions on in various management positions. So I, I'm very fortunate in the fact that I was a able to gainfully be employed and had family and, and uh, um, my two, two children uh, went through, through college, so everything's fine in that regard. Uh, uh, so everybody's experience was differently, only because they, they handled their um, stress in different manners. Some, some people were out, outgoing with it, other people were reserved. Um, but it was, it was kind of hard dealing with um, 
family and, and friends when you did come home because some people wanted to hear the experience and some people uh, pushed, us, pushed us away. So it was tough. Yeah. Why do they refer at times or people refer to times as Vietnam being an unpopular war? Well, it's kind of strange because I can remember how, how the whole experience went down uh, you know, in the early 60s when I was in high school. The, um, uh, it became a debating issue for various classes like uh, you know, speech class or uh, uh, some of our English classes that we had. Uh, uh, I do remember one teacher was pretty much anti-war, so she was trying, I thought she was just trying to uh, establish that as a, a basis for debate because, you know, with, with so many different students, uh, everybody had a different uh, different point of view. Some were for the war, some were against the war. Uh, it was it was, it was a, a gamut of a, a wide, the spectrum was wide open for every, everything. In the early part of the war, of course, uh, most people were for the war because the notion was that the, uh, um, uh, I forget the name of the ship, that was, uh, 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 there was a Navy ship that was supposedly attacked that, would, that initiated the, the, uh, the build-up of the war. Um, and that is in question right now as to whether or not that, that really did happen, but uh, um, the Gulf of Tonkin, uh, yeah, the Gulf of Tonkin. Uh, after that resolution was passed, and it was more or less passed uh, overwhelmingly, I think maybe just one or two congressmen uh, were, were, were opposed to it. But uh, uh, I think what happened was the war just drug out and drug out, and uh, there was a lot of those, all those troops were sent over there. You know, when I was there, there was 500, over 500,000 troops there with me. But uh, the notion was that, uh, that when we were over there, we felt as if our hands were kind of tied as to actually doing what needed to be done to, to win the war. It was more a, a defensive action. So that was where some of the frustration came in, that we were there to defend an area, but not, not, to, win, not to win the war. So, uh, and then as time went by and the bodies started coming home, uh, that made it uh, tougher for the people to accept it. And, and um, uh, then when the Tet Offensive happened, although it was a military victory from the standpoint of uh, the U.S. and the Allied troops were concerned, uh, the fact that the, the VC and NVA were able to launch such a wide range uh, a Tet Offensive in various cities all, all up and down the coast on, in Vietnam, um, that really uh, pushed the sentiment back home to, to become um, anti-war and let's get this thing over with and get bring the guys home. Tell me briefly why we even got involved in Vietnam. What was the reason for that? I think uh, in my mind, um, of course I'm not uh, privy to all the, the various reasons why things were done, but uh, uh, I, I think the, the, the government was, uh, uh, um, their, their idea was to stop the domino effect of um, the communist countries overtaking various countries through uh, through China, down through Vietnam, into Cambodia, <coughs> and into uh, all the Indonesian countries uh, out in the, uh, um, off the coast from Vietnam, Malaysia, and all the, Burma, and all the other countries in that area. And the thinking back then was uh, that this was a, uh, something had to be done to stop the domino effect, to, to stop the, uh, in, uh, the growth of Vietnam, uh, communism. And uh, that's how that's how it was sold to me. Um, I'm going to kind of digress just a bit here, but sure. you know, being a Vietnam veteran and an American citizen, Bill, what does freedom mean to you? And and tell me about the price for freedom. Okay. In relation to Vietnam or, or to today? Okay. Just whatever you feel. What does freedom mean to you? Okay. And then, you know, men lost their lives. Were right. wounded. Uh, tell me about the price for freedom. Okay. Well, the price of freedom is is a uh, is a very valuable or it's a it's a, it's an item that uh, that is is for it's it's the most uh, costly thing you can you can surrender uh, a person's life. Um, um, the monetary value uh, there's of course monetary value put in there. To put a soldier in harm's way, but uh, but for a soldier uh, to sacrifice his or her life for the notion of freedom is, is the ultimate uh, sacrifice. 
um, and uh, freedom is not re uh, rendered for nothing. There's always a cost to it. Uh, and uh, through the history of our country, freedom has been gained through through conflict. Um, um, and uh, it's it's an unfortunate thing. I, I don't know how you can how you can gain obtain freedom and retain it without butting heads with other people. Uh, at least in, in my time, I just haven't seen it happen where successfully where, where you can actually uh, obtain freedom and, and gain freedom uh, by sim simple dialogue. It just seems to be, during my lifetime, it's been nothing but wars. It's unfortunate. I, I wish there was another way. Uh, in, 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 uh, in my mind, I think back in time and I, I just wish there was a way that we could resolve issues without war, without conflict. It just seems like it would be an easy thing to do. But uh, when there's fences and barriers and borders and, and uh, lines drawn in the sand, um, people are testing that and um, territory and um, freedom is, is something that is pretty much taken away when, when one group comes in and, and sets new rules. So in, uh, the concept of freedom is a good one. It's something I've lived with with all my life. It's, get, it's enabled me to um, do various things with my family and, and provide for a family. And uh, um, I, I just can't see what it would be like to live a life without freedom. So that's why people are, are prepared to, to, um, to protect it. What does the American flag mean and represent to you? Well, the American flag is a symbol. It represents uh, um, the values that our, our country uh, has. Uh, it um, it's it's a standard that we that we look at, and when we look at it, you you think of uh, a multitude of things that uh, that the country stands for, and what uh, we as a as a society stand for, and um, it's something to be protected and honored and. And um, it just pretty much makes makes me feel proud when I see it, and, and uh, I want to protect it at all times. What should people remember about Vietnam, Bill? Well, it was a, a time uh, a uh, time uh, in in the lives of turmoil. The 1960s was a was a time of major transition in so many different uh, things. From the standpoint of uh, family issues, uh, a lot of people were growing up so fast. Uh, there was a lot of racial tension at home. Uh, the the Vietnam War uh, stopping communism was a big issue back then, uh, uh, and uh, the Vietnam War was it wasn't something we as a s soldiers and citizens basically we didn't want it. It was given to us. It was a hot potato to handle, and uh, um, we we just uh, took what uh, most of us, as, a, as in my generation, we were growing up, and, and our parents and uncles and and even our aunts were involved in World War II and Korean War, and uh, we had that <clears throat> set as an example of uh, uh, what was done to uh, 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 retrain. Uh, 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 those, those, our, the greatest generation, they did things to keep our freedom and to preserve it. And uh, when, when the Vietnam War was presented to us uh, uh, as an issue to stop the flow of communism, uh, we, were, we were asked to serve and, and most of us served. Uh, there were some that ducked it, some that found other things to do. But most of us, uh, we, you know, we were called and we served and did our duties. Uh, some of us weren't too happy about serving there, I can tell you that for sure. But uh, uh, we all did what we had to do and we all, you know, all came home. Uh, those that came home, came home. Uh, we left a lot, of, a lot of men and women over there. But uh, uh, we, and that's why we have the wall and we want to remember them and, and uh, honor their sacrifice. Just a couple more kind of follow-up questions. Were there drugs used in Vietnam? Uh, yes, there there was drugs. Where it was an issue when I was there in 1968 um, and 69. 
Um, I didn't uh, partake in that, uh, uh, but uh, I know it was it was uh, running rampant. It became worse of an issue after I left. But uh, it was a situation uh, that was uh, um, a lot of the men were able to get their uh, uh, marijuana or, or drugs that they were able to get a hold of um, in the in the uh, um, marketplace in the cities that we were serving at, and. Um, I don't think it was a major, major issue, but it was it was there, and uh, unfortunately, it was tolerated to a degree by uh, the decision makers at the time. Um, well, you hear things, you know, and that's one of the things you hear. It's you know the drug usage. If it was there, if it was yeah. just hearsay or what have you, but probably reflective of the culture here. You think, or the fact that they're readily available there. Mm -hmm. um, well, since I didn't really participate in the uh, drug. Um, um, situation. I, I don't know how they actually got their drugs or who they contacted, but uh, they. Uh, I think it came to us from the people on the outside, uh, pe the people in the marketplace, uh, the Vietnamese. They were selling it, and uh, uh, like I said, it wasn't a real big issue for us because we we're in aviation, and you had to be drug free to fly and, sure. and to maintain the aircraft and. And all those things. I know it was an issue with with us, but um, if you ask me, drinking was more of a problem than than drug use. Well, like in any war, don't you think right, that the right. alcohol was pretty prevalent? But, exactly. But you hear things about Vietnam, you know. Yeah. Have you seen any movies that come close to what Vietnam was like? Um. Yeah. Um, Apocalypse Now was probably about the opposite of what what I saw and experienced, but. Uh, um, there were there were a couple movies that were they're very uh, uh, very uh, close to what I experienced. Um, and I'm just trying to think of the one name, but um, are there any sights or sounds or smells that remind you of Vietnam today? Um, yeah, when I go to a Vietnamese uh, uh, restaurant, that immediately brings it right to mind. And uh, of course, whenever I hear uh, a Huey flying by, uh, there's very few of those flying anymore. But when you hear that wop wop sound of a helicopter, that immediately, uh, first thing I want to do is I want to look around to see where that thing is, because you always hear it before you see it, and um, uh, that is an immediately, that's a trigger, immediate trigger to bring back some memories, and um, uh, the, the smells and, and the sound of a helicopter are, are the two things that uh, that are immediate triggers for me. Are you proud that you're a Vietnam veteran? Sure, sure, yeah. I think most veterans are proud that they were over there and served and, and survived and came home. Um, um, of course, there are some people there on the opposite side of the spectrum. They um, don't want to talk about it uh, or they deny what, what happened while they were there because not everybody was honorable when they were in Vietnam. There were some characters over there that I never wanted to associate with because they were either going to get themselves killed or, or me killed with them if, they, if I stood too close to them uh, or I did things that they were doing. But um, uh, I avoided any of those situations because my goal was to survive the situation I was in and, and go home. Um, because I, like I said, I was married before I went over there and uh, um, I took an R&R &R and flew to Hawaii and met my wife there. and. Fortunately for us, my daughter was conceived there. So, uh, and then she was born in San Francisco when uh, when I went to my next duty station after my Vietnam tour. So, uh, I had a lot of reasons to want to survive and keep myself clean and, and out of trouble. I figured was going to do it for me. I, I just needed to stay away from issues and stay away from uh, uh, situations that might uh, might put me in harm's way. Do people thank you for your service to our country? Sure, sure. Um, uh, from using it, and it used to catch you by surprise because you're doing something and you're not even thinking about it, and, and then someone will just maybe ask <coughs> um, ask a question, and then you say, "Yeah, I was in Vietnam," and then they just say thank you and shake your hand. It's always a great feeling, and uh, and it always catches you by surprise, and, and you don't really know what to say or how to respond to it, other than to shake your hand and smile. That's that's about all. That's all, that's all I do. 
I'm going to ask you to do one more thing that I ask all the veterans at the end of my interview. When I tell you, can you look into the camera and give me a salute? Sure. Okay. All right. If you've seen any of my films, this will make sense. So okay. just trust me on this. Okay, whenever you're ready. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs>